Christ and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Today is the, is the only Sunday of the Blessed Month of Nasi. And this kind of concludes the, the Coptic year. And so that's why we're getting ready to celebrate Nairu's feast. Um, we have Vespers tomorrow, and we have the feast on Tuesday, but we'll get to that later. Um, as we reflect on this gospel passage, it should be familiar from what we read uh, last week. So the last two Sundays are always in regard to the second coming, this unexpected time. As everything else in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ was a surprise for man, so his second coming also will be unexpected. It will be unexpected in the power and the glory. Unexpected was his birth by a virgin, the Holy Virgin St. Mary. Unexpected was his poverty. Unexpected was his miracle working. Unexpected was every single word that he said. Unexpected was his humiliation. Unexpected was his voluntary death. Unexpected was his resurrection. Unexpected was his ascension. Unexpected was the church and the spreading of the faith. And unexpected will be his second coming. And so the church is asking us to pause for a second before we immediately go into the new year and to reflect and to ask questions to ourselves. How will we meet you, O Lord? Help us, Lord, that however much possible that you can to prepare us for that encounter, that unexpected encounter. Our Lord has given us very clear instructions of how to prepare. It's very, very clear. You know, when we're in school, I would always get really nervous about upcoming tests. Sometimes there was a test that would blindside you, pop quizzes and things like that. <clears throat> and you felt like you might see questions that you didn't anticipate, that you didn't study for. You just weren't ready. But at times, you would get a really nice teacher, and the teacher would say, I'm giving you a test, and not only that, here are the questions to the test. Make sure you are prepared uh, to answer all these questions. There will be no surprises. In a way, that's what our Lord Jesus Christ is doing in Scripture. He is giving us the questions to the exam. He is telling us exactly what's expected of us and on what we will be judged on. He's not trying to spring it on us or catch us in some kind of trap. No, he's trying to prepare us in the best way possible. But we need to be reminded that this life is short and that something unexpected is going to happen. But there is an expectation that we have. Have we fed the hungry? Have we given drink to the thirsty? Have we clothed the naked? Have we visited the sick and the imprisoned? These are the questions of the final exam. How will we answer? Only we can decide that for ourselves. Why do these things matter so much? Why does this matter to our Lord Jesus Christ? Why are they required of us? Because those who belong to God must be clothed in love. These are acts of mercy, and with them come, come signs of love. And love is the sign that we know that God has given us to be part of his family. This is a way that we can be uh, very clear that we're part of his family. Today, this gospel, and last week, the gospel makes us come face to face with a reality that is beautiful to some and brutal for others. Whenever I come to these two Gospels about his second coming, I can't help to think about the words of our Lord Jesus Christ about the last judgment. And once again, we are in awe and astonishment that the Lord, the King of heaven and earth, should reveal this mystery to us. He welcomes us to his kingdom. And he welcomes us to understand what is required of us and how we will be tested on that great and last day. 
And if we pay uh, close attention to this teaching about the last judgment, I think we come to some uh, surprising moments. Surprise about what's contained in this message and what's not contained in the last judgment. For instance, there is no assumption of being perfect when it comes to the judgment. The Son of Man does not require or he does not separate the people based on the fact of whether they are perfect or not perfect. That's not how it works. He doesn't separate them based on the fact of whether or not they have ever sinned or ever done wrong in their lives. He doesn't separate them based on how long their prayers are or how diligently they fast. He doesn't separate them based on how amazing their cross looks when they cross themselves or make their prostrations. These are not wrong. I'm just trying to make a point. He doesn't separate them based on how many icons they have in their walls and their homes. These are all external to some sense. And we have to be careful. Our Lord judges the heart. And more specifically, the way our heart manifests its love. The way the heart manifests its mercy to others. The way our heart manifests kindness to others. At the last judgment, the criterion is love, plain and simple. Love in action. But there's a catch. It's not love of those who are easy to love, like our friends and our families and people who are generally nice to us, or even to animals who, who look so cute and amazing. No, it's not love to those who are, it is a love to those who are typically ignored. It is a love to those who are even despised in our society. It is a love to those who are the most difficult to love. A love even to those who seem unlovable. To love the poor and to those who are hungry. To love strangers who have no family, who have no friends. To love the sick who are stuck at home or in hospitals. Or even those who are in prisons who are serving time for their crimes. In a way, we are encouraged to, to bend down, to go to a certain level, because this is precisely what our Lord Jesus Christ has done. He has bent down and has become man for us. He has become like us. So we know the criteria for the final exam. There are no surprises. We are judged on how we treat our fellow man. Who, by the way, are created in the image and likeness of God. And the more those people are hidden or silent and easy to ignore, the more important it is for us to love them. That we sacrifice to serve them. That is what is meant to be a son and daughter of God. It's not just a title that we're given. It's a reality that becomes our complete identity. And so we are reminded that there are very real and lasting repercussions to our faithful action or our faithless negligence, unfortunately. The results are permanent. The results are permanent. Either way, because once we die, there is no more hope for change or repentance. That's it. We are judged by the real and true divine judge. Instead of seeing this as a threat to our lives and to our existence, we should instead see it as a great wake-up call. That's what the church is trying to say. In these last two gospel readings, that's what the church is trying to say. Wake up. What an amazing opportunity to focus on an opportunity to, to do good to others with the full assurance that we won't be wasting our lives. In fact, we'll be gaining our lives through the sacrifice of others. St. James speaks of this tension in the epistle of St. James chapter 2 when he writes, For judgment is without mercy to the, to the one who has shown no mercy. 
Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and be filled, but you do not give them the things that they are needed for their body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well, but even the demons believe and they tremble. St. James tells us that it's not enough to simply believe in God and his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. After all, even the demons believe and they tremble. But the demons don't worship God. They don't serve him. They don't offer up their lives as a living sacrifice to God. We are called to be different. We are called to be different. Faith in Christ means living a life in Christ. And that is what Orthodox Christianity is in a nutshell. Living a life in Christ. It's not merely words about Christ. It is this life-changing conviction that leads to a changed view of the world and of ourselves and of our neighbors and of our society. It's a complete transformation. The Lord, he poured out his life for us out of love. So we too are called to pour out our lives for others. This is, we're trying to imitate our master to become love. And the reward is much greater than anything we can imagine. God tells us that in loving and serving others, the poor, the sick, the prisoner, the naked, we are actually doing something even greater than we think. We are serving the Lord himself. We are serving the Lord himself. Do we need any more motivation than this? This is what is expected of us because that is what our Lord has done for each one of us. He has fed us with both food as well as heavenly bread. He has clothed us not only with clothing, but with garments of righteousness. He has visited us in sickness and given us both physical and spiritual healing. He has not only visited us while we were imprisoned with our sins, but he has completely freed us from the power of sin and death. So the church is asking us to do some spiritual housekeeping at the end of the year. We should hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the gospel, according to St. Matthew, is not necessarily part of today's gospel. Again, today's gospel is part of St. Matthew, but it ends at a certain point. And if we keep reading from the gospel of St. Matthew chapter 24, and we kept reading to about verse 42, it says, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had come, had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. And again, he says in Matthew chapter 25, he says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Yet again, we hear the same teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of St. Luke when he says, Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the son of man is coming in the hour you do not expect. The Lord reminds us that we are to remain watchful, to remain vigilant over our souls and over our spiritual life because, because of what we are carrying in our souls is very precious. And sometimes I don't think we actually understand what we carry inside. We carry the Holy Spirit. We have become temples of the Holy Spirit through the baptism of Christ. And we are reminded that none of us knows when we will meet the Lord. 
So we should prepare to meet the Lord on a daily basis. Be watchful. It means that we are not to approach life like zombies or those who are half asleep. In the Roman Empire, the idea of a soldier falling asleep at his post would be a grave offense. In fact, they would correct this by lighting the soldier on fire. We must be awake. We must have our eyes open to the reality because we've been awakened by the light and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means that we need to have the ability to see what is happening in the world around us, sometimes under our very noses. We have to assess things critically in the light of the gospel. We are also watchful when we care to make sure that we don't neglect our spiritual lives and lose our focus. The Lord says that if we are not ready for his coming, it will be like a thief in the night. We can meet our king at any moment. We are asked to be watchful so that that moment doesn't catch us off guard. What he tells us is that we as Christians must not be distracted in this world, this world that we live in. But we are called for a life of prayer. We are called for a life of watchfulness. And this is the good news. It may not be easy at first, but with God's help, and I think with the instruction of your, your spiritual guide, your father confession, we can grow, we can mature in our spiritual lives. So just to conclude... The church is saying it's time for us to refocus our lives. The end of the year is a time the church reminds us to come to our senses, to come to our Lord, to come back to life. Don't think that we can just be comfortable with our a little bit of extra fasting here and there, a little bit of prayer if it's convenient, and just call it a day. No. God requires his children to show acts of mercy and kindness to everyone. If his children do not show love, his children will be unrecognizable to him. And in fact, he will be unrecognizable to us. Our Lord tells us that what is expected of his, the children of God out of love and mercy for each one of us. He tells us the truth. What is the truth? The truth is, we will be judged. Sometimes it's an uncomfortable statement. We will be judged. Will we be judged according to our feelings? Will we be judged according to our strong opinions? No. Will we be judged according to our words about God? No. We will be judged according to our actions, which are a response to the faith that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. The final exam is coming. It's coming one day. And we already have the questions. How will we respond? Will we inherit eternal life? The Lord Jesus tells us that it will depend on whether or not we have shared the things of life, our life, with those who are in need. Our food, our clothing, our comforting presence, our time. May God number us among the righteous. and May he reward us with a true and unending life. And glory be to God forever. Amen.